Gina um, Ulatello is, she works for NOAA as well. She's the program manager of environmental chemistry at the National Marine Fisheries Service, uh, their Northwest Fisheries Science Center. So she's also connecting to us from Seattle. Um, which is why we're using WebEx for her too. So she's going to be talking to us about the federal safety, the seafood safety program that was initiated during and after the oil spill. So Gina, I'm going to move the microphone, but take it away. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to be here. So you're probably wondering why somebody from Seattle would be analyzing samples as part of this oil spill. Um, when environmental disasters such as the Exxon Valdez and North Cape oil spills, as well as Hurricane Katrina occurred, there, was a, there were major concerns about how these events could affect the seafood quality and safety. Um, over the years, the Northwest Fisheries Science Center here in Seattle has conducted research on the availability, uptake, and disposition of oil-related compounds. And we were able to use this information and knowledge in addressing the seafood concerns as part of these um, environmental disasters. So as part of this, we've developed and um, used a number of analytical methods, chemical methods to um, measure these contaminants in seafood. And we've also conducted onboard um, bile analyses that Susan Snyder um, described what she's been doing. We've actually done that on shipboard analyses after the Exxon Valdez oil spill, just to look for um, exposure in fish after a spill. Um, we've also developed screening methods. Those are rapid methods to look for oil-type compounds in sediments and tissues. But the gold standard that was used as part of this oil spill, as well as some of the others, is um, a gas chromatography mass spectrometry uh, method that we developed here at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. So you've probably, this has probably been discussed already uh, a bit this morning, but petroleum, con there's, there are thousands of petroleum or compounds in petroleum. Um, they include, uh, things such as aliphatic hydrocarbons, allocyclic, uh, polar compounds, elements such as sulfur, vanadium, nickel, and insoluble co components including asphaltines and resins. In addition, they include a lot of aromatics including heterocyclics, meaning um, that not, they not only contain carbon and hydrogen, they also contain things like sulfur or nitrogen in the rings. Anyway, um, as you can see from this table, the abundance is, it varies among these compounds as well as the bioavailability, the persistence in tissues of marine organisms, as well as the toxicity. But overall, um, the focus for seafood safety issues as well as other uh, toxicity studies normally focuses on the aromatic compounds due to their toxicity and potential persistence. So this is a slide just um, showing a quick diagram on um, the fate of oil when organisms are exposed to it, and you've probably already heard this this morning, but aromatic, hyd aromatic compounds, including polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, are um, rapidly taken up by fish, but they're also rapidly uh, metabolized. Um, and eliminated from the body. Whereas in invertebrates such as uh, shrimp, uh, crabs, lobsters, and shellfish, the metabolism varies. It's not as good as it is for fish, and um, the elimination may not be as quick. It just kind of depends on the species. So I'm going to um, go over a little bit of the development of the protocols as part of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Uh, these protocols were developed with the uh, Gulf states in addition with NOAA and FDA and other um, federal agencies. And the starting point of these protocols was uh, from a NOAA publication, I believe that it came out in 2002, entitled Managing Seafood Safety After an Oil Spill that Ruth Yender and other folks in Gary Shiganaka's shop uh, published. And it's, it's been a foundation for this oil spill and it was greatly appreciated. So 
the lessons that we've learned from oil spill response from previous spills uh, have been that a rapid response is essential, and this helps address uh, public concerns as far as the safety of seafood. Um, regulators and scientists really do need to work together to identify the key questions that must be answered and the criteria for the data that will be collected. Um, we also know that time must be taken to design a sampling and analysis plan that provides managers with data from which to make decisions on, such as reopening fish, fisheries or not reopening. And there's a, it's important to keep a balance with that because both of these, you know, these things are important. Um, a tiered approach to analysis is cost effective and allows for an adaptive approach to sampling. And this is what we used for as part of the seafood safety response for the Deepwater Horizon was a tiered uh, approach. Um, the other thing that was is incredibly important, and you guys probably know this better than anybody, is that baseline data is really important. For the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, we did have some baseline data on seafood that was collected in 2005, 2006 in response to Hurricane Katrina's and Rita that occurred in the Gulf, uh, but it was for a limited uh, number of, uh, or different types of species. We had basically had focused on white shrimp mostly and Atlantic uh, croaker, but we did have some baseline data. And the other thing that we know is that rapid turnaround of the analytical results um, allows managers to take action to mitigate damage and in injury and help inform the public. It's important. So part of the seafood testing protocols, as Gary has told you, was um, it, it was two-tiered. Petroleum from a spill can cause seafood to be unfit for consumption based on the presence of PAHs that have the potential to cause toxic or cancer-causing effects in humans, as well as producing seafood that is off-smelling or off-tasting, and that's known as taint. Um, cancer-causing polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which I'll refer to as PAHs, are of concern because they can be harmful to humans if consumed in sufficient amounts over a prolonged period of time. And although petroleum taint is not necessarily harmful and may be present even if the PAH concentrations are below levels of concern, a product that is tainted with petroleum is considered adulterated and is prohibited for, for sale as food. So therefore, the seafood collected during this oil spill um, was tested by both the sensory testing as well as the chemical methods to make sure that it was not tainted as well as it did not contain high levels of these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, here, I'm a chemist, I have to show a couple couple of figures like this always, but um, these are, uh, there were 13 PAHs that were selected um, including seven cancer-causing compounds. And here I'm just showing some structures of some of these compounds. Some of these were not included. But uh, the cancer-causing PAHs include the benzoapyrene and the chrysine, other PAHs that are uh, toxic but they're non-cancer-causing that were measured as part of this effort were anthracene and um, phenanthrene pyrene. In addition, um, as the oil spill uh, continued and they were using uh, dispersants to help mitigate the effects of, and of the oil, uh, it became clear that there was some public concern about the dispersant component and in the seafood. So FDA, in collaboration with our laboratory and some of their laboratories, uh, developed and validated a method to measure one of the components in the dispersant, uh, dioxyl sodium sulfyl succinate, also known as, we call it DOS. Uh, we developed a rapid method, rapid sensitive method, to measure that in seafood. Um, and as well, FDA, it became pretty obvious once the seafood testing started that our GC mass spec method was too labor intensive in order to be able to analyze the large number of seafood samples that were coming in through the states and the federal waters. So FDA uh, developed and validated a more rapid HPLC fluorescence method to measure for these compounds. 
So both of these methods were used for the PAHs, and then just one method was used uh, to measure DOS in the seafood. As far as the sampling protocols, uh, seafood species that were harvest, harvested commercially, recreationally, and for sub subsistence use were sampled so that the risk to a wide range of consumers could be evaluated. Um, a number of species that were present throughout the oiled area were targeted because sampling of widespread species would allow spatial comparisons and statistical inferences that were applicable to the area. In general, finfish, oysters, and shrimp were collected in more nearshore waters, whereas in offshore fishing areas, and those were depths greater than about 200 meters, finfish were the primary seafood that were collected as part of the um, study that we did. One exception, as Gary mentioned, was the collection of royal red shrimp that were captured in deeper, more offshore waters than the other commercially important shrimp species. So here is a, um, a map of, uh, that was done in July, 20, on July 22, 2010, and it just shows uh, sampling areas in federal waters that were close to fishing in the northern Gulf of, of Mexico in, in response to the spill. The purple, and, the purple and dark blue coloration shows the oil concentrations estimated in the water with areas shown in light purple having the lowest oil concentrations and the areas shown in the dark blue having the highest oil concentrations. The heavy red and black lines here, I don't know if you can see this, these red lines and the black lines indicate uh, the th we started first sampling at more, in more near shore areas uh, to see what the uh, levels of the PAHs and the, and the sensory testing was done on seafood in these areas. But as the more oil began spilling in the Gulf, then it became pretty clear that we had to uh, figure out a better survey design. So we came up with three areas um, that were going to be close to fishing, and then an additional area designated D was around the perimeter of the closed area to ensure the closure, that the closure of the fishing area was effective. So area A was um, minimal to no oil. Oiling occurred in this area. This is off the western shelf, Florida shelf area. Uh, area B was closed fishing area just south of the um, wellhead and that had moderate oiling. Area C from the state federal boundary to the wellhead had more heavy oiling as you can see here. And I wanted to mention that once, once those uh, four areas were um, decided upon, then what ended up happening was that the areas A through D were subsequently divided into 30 by 30 nautical mile grids that were numbered to aid in further refining the sampling locations that were done in the federal waters here. So what we um, started with as part of this oil spill um, was that we didn't do testing for reopening really until there was no oil present. And we really started in these areas that were outside, you know, that had little to no oiling. That's just a piece of information. In addition, um, we also classified the seafood sampling. So we did surveillance, also known as baseline, uh, collected prior to closure and collected prior to when oil actually occurred in an area. Uh, there was surveillance perimeter. Those were samples that were collected outside the closure areas, the area D that I showed in the previous slide. Surveillance closed. Uh, this was, we obtain information in these closed areas just for monitoring purposes. Then there were the reopening. These were samples that had to pass both sensory and chemical testing prior to an area being reopened. Then surveillance reopened samples were also collected once an area was reopened. And they were collected at least one week after the reopening of an area. And it continued through two seven-day sampling periods that were separated in time by at least seven days. And then another um, category was dockside surveillance, and this was implemented in major ports in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. What ha would happen is that the fishing vessels would come in and uh, they would take a 
a very small sampling of what they had been caught, and then we would um, analyze it to ensure that these products would not go out to the public if something was wrong for consumption. So here's the reopening criteria. I think Gary showed this. So there's no, no visibly floating oil, uh, sensory testing of raw and cooked product. At least 70% of the testers were to find no indication of taint. Once the sensory testing passed, then the samples were analyzed for PAHs, and then once the DOS method was set up, and also for DOS, by approved analytical laboratories, um, all continuous sites within an area had to pass sensory and chemical testing criteria before it was considered for reopening, and then those data and the reports were sent to FDA for concurrence for reopening of a sampling area. So I'm going to go over um, some of the results that we uh, had for the seafood safety sampling. Here's a, here's a map showing um, the sites that were that we, uh, that where the samples were collected, uh, we have primary responsibility for seafood safety in the federal waters. Keeping the Gulf seafood safe meant closing fisheries in those areas that were affected or threatened by the oil. So here's a, um, the dots, the red dots are the reopening sites, the yellowish, lightish yellowish are the surveillance closed, the dark blues Spots are the surveillance perimeter, the more orangey are surveillance reopened, and the white uh, dots are surveillance, so the baseline samples. And this was, these are um, sampling sites, I think through March of 2011. I had not updated this slide, but basically the more of the sampling did take place, um, but it would just be dots upon dots showing more of the um, surveillance reopened, more of the orange. So as far as the sensory testing results that were conducted for various sampling categories, except for the last round of the surveillance reopened, those were done for chemistry testing only. Um, sensory testing results showed that uh, less than 2.2% failed sensory testing, so which was good. And now I'm going to show some of the chemistry results. Um, here I'm showing the levels of um, one of the non-cancer-causing PAHs that were measured, this naphthalene that Susan talked about earlier. And here I'm showing FISH, and LOC stands for level of concern. So uh, the FDA level of concern for this particular PAH is uh, more than 32,000 nanograms parts per billion. For shrimp, that level is 123,000 parts per billion. Um, the B, R, S, R, S, C, S, P, and D, S stand for the different sampling categories. This is baseline, reopening, um, surveillance reopening. These are surveillance closed, surveillance perimeter, and dockside surveillance. Anyways, you can see the levels are quite low. This is on a log, log scale, so this is going up by an order of magnitude for each one of these. So the levels were all below 100 parts per billion. Um, so the, the levels of this compound were anywhere from 100 to uh, 1,000 to 10,000 times lower than the um, level of concern that FDA had uh, provided for the area after the spill. I do want to note that we did not include these out the alkylated homologs as part of this PAH. There are several different um, versions of this compound that have different chemical structures, and all, the, the main point to take here is even when we did a subset of these samples, including the alkylated homologs, the levels were, were still way below the levels of concern. Here's another uh, PAH that we were monitoring in these seafood samples. This is phenanthrene. Again, it's another um, non-cancer-causing PAH. Again, it doesn't include the alkylated homologs. Fish data are shown on the left. The shrimp data are shown on the right. Many of these compounds were below the detection limits for the GC mass spec or the HPLC fluorescent system that were uh, being used to measure these compounds. And again, the levels were 
anywhere from 10 to 10,000 times lower than what were found, than the levels of concern, the FDA levels of concern. Here I'm showing the data for uh, one of the cancer-causing H's, benzoa pyrene. Uh, again, the fish data are on the left, and the shrimp data are on the shrimp and crab data are on the right. Uh, again, most of these levels were below our detection limit, so they did not. This, the seafood did not have levels that would pose a problem for uh, consumption. And here I'm showing again another uh, cancer-causing PAH that we were monitoring. Again, the fish data are on the left, the shrimp and crab data are on the right. Again, similar to what we've seen for the benzoa pyrene, the levels were mostly below the limit of detection for the methods that were being used. We found a few that were detected, but they were orders of magnitude, thousands of times lower than the level of concern. Here I'm showing the levels of uh, the dispersant component DOS in the seafood. Uh, the fish are shown in orange. Those are below the uh, detection level. Shown in the open blue. Fish, the levels that were above uh, the level of, or above our detection level are shown. They're more solid looking. And as you can see, the levels of DOS that we found were orders of magnitude lower than any of they're the levels of concern, and they were mostly below our detection limits for the instrument that we were using. And the other thing that I wanted to show was um, I just took all the data. I wanted to just kind of get a picture of what, what did the PAHs look like in the region over that year of the oil spill occurring in the seafood. So here we, I'm showing the sampling date starting with, I think we started doing analyses in early May, and for the fish it went through to uh, mid-June, I believe, and there's a couple things I want to show here. First, that the levels are really low. These are in parts per billion, and the highest levels were under 25 parts per billion. Um, we don't have a level of concern for the, some of the 13 PAHs, but what you can see is that the levels are really low, cause, and in addition, the peak of, the, of these compounds appeared to occur, oh, maybe a month after the uh, wellhead had been, uh, the oil had been stopped from the wellhead and it had been uh, repaired, and then the levels just fell, and most of the levels were below, I think, uh, five parts per billion by June. So you can see that it kind of peaked and then they went down, but these levels are so low. Um, they, they're just showing that it just, compounds did not seem to uh, really pose a problem. Here I'm showing the same type of data only for shrimp, crab, and oysters. The highest levels that we found were these samples that were uh, collected as part of uh, surveillance, the baseline samples near shore, and this is even before the oil had had even hit in those areas. Whoops. Sorry. Anyway, so the highest levels that we found here were um, just from nearshore oysters, and as Ruth talked about, these levels are really, really low. And I wanted to mention these levels are, are pretty much similar. I, I don't know about the oysters, but at least as far as the shrimp and the um, Atlantic croaker that we had done after the uh, Hurricane Katrina testing, these are very similar to what was seen before. In fact, some of the levels were higher right after Hurricane Katrina than what we found as part of this oil spill, the deep water sampling. Um, Again, I wanted to look at the concentrations overall in finfish or DOS. Again, uh, you notice that we didn't do testing. Uh, most of this started in late late June is when we started the testing. I went, but we went back and looked at some of those uh, seafood samples because the method really wasn't up and going till later on in the summer. But um, anyway, the highest levels were found uh, probably right around when they were still dis using the dispersant, and then the levels just rapidly started falling off. And there weren't very many uh, detected levels in fin fish. And the story's even more interesting for the shrimp, crab, and oysters. We only had one detectable level in an animal. I think it was a brown shrimp sample that was uh, collected in March of 2011. But really, the levels are just quite low. 
So in summary of what we found as part of our seafood testing, uh, the testing began in early May, as I said, and then it, we completed it here in November 2011, but the, sample, the last samples were collected, I believe, at the end of June of 2011, and more than 8,000 seafood specimens were tested. Low percentages of the samples failed sensory testing. Um, the concentrations of both the cancer-causing and non-cancer-causing PHs as well as DOS were below uh, the detection level, and if they were detected, they were at least two to three orders of magnitude below the level of concern for each of the compounds. Um, all areas closed within the exclusive economic zone were reopened by April 19, 2011, which was a great deal, great thing to get done, and part of the Part of the issue was the royal red shrimp. Um, it was closed, but as Gary mentioned, it was the last thing that was closed, and then we, I think it was reopened in February. And then what we did find is that the surveillance reopening test results did ensure that the seafood was continued to be safe for consumption. So uh, as far as the protocol, I think it really worked well. Uh, Coming at it from a chemist's viewpoint, I'd hate to be doing method development again during a big oil Bill, um, while we're while we're trying to do testing at the same time, it 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 made for interesting times in the laboratory. My boss um, had retired six months before the oil spill, and we begged her and another one of our chemists to come back and help with the oil spill, which they did. Um, otherwise, I don't think we could have done what we did. And I I just wanted to. Uh, show this last slide for the acknowledgments. There were many, many people. I mean, it was uh, many hundreds of people that helped with the prepping the samples, et cetera. So anyway, um, thank you for listening to me talk about our results, our findings. <laughs>